hello everyone. I'm Nanette Hersberger, wife, mother, and teacher living in Rockford, Michigan. And I'd like to start by thanking everyone for watching our second video in the series of wellness workshops hosted by Deb Havens. Deb Havens is running for Kent County Commissioner here in Plainfield Township in the Rockford area. She has taught in high schools and university classrooms and has a doctrine in educational leadership. And she is the only candidate uh, running with an educational background here in the Kent County Board of Commissioners. So I'm pleased to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Deb Havens. Nan, thank you so much. Yes, you are a very good friend and colleague. I appreciate it. Um, so I wanna thank you as well for joining us tonight. Um, we're gonna be discussing the benefits of mindfulness. And I have to admit, I didn't know too much about this. But um, from what I understand from earlier uh, looking into this topic is that mindfulness can really help as we deal with emotional stress and sometimes the physical consequences of that stress. Um, mindfulness can help us recognize anxiety and depression, sort of as even messages that our body is sending us that we need to pay attention. And if we pay attention, we can actually learn something new about ourselves that could actually lead to transformation of ourselves or our circumstances. So I didn't just come up with this myself. It is a result of my earlier conversations with Benjamin Reisterer, who is my guest tonight. Benjamin is a psychotherapist and a clinical director of Claystone Office of Mindful Counseling GR. And he's, oh, by the way, this is one of three private practices in Grand Rapids. So Benjamin, I wanna welcome you and let's get started. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Deb, and uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to um, begin with, um, you know, kind of what's obvious to everyone, that this is a period of enormous stress for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. And, um, Let's understand the kinds of emotional stress that can be relieved basically by practicing mindfulness. So what are the things that people might be experiencing now that actually could be helped if they knew and understood and practiced mindfulness? Yeah, so I, I want to be really careful in how we talk about how mindfulness actually helps. Um, it's not a cure-all or a catch-all. Um, it's not going to be the thing that um, uh, just takes away all the pain or all the anxiety or depression or anything like that. It's really more of a way of being and a way of looking at uh, the, the way that your body, your mind, um, and yourself is kind of responding to the world around you. And when you practice that type of like gentle curiosity with yourself, um, you can start to really um, see how your body and your emotions are reacting to circumstances. Um, so then it allows you to move away from reacting to things to responding to things. Um, there's a, a there's a big difference between reactions and responses um, when it comes to these types of things. And so mindfulness is really helpful in um, just about any circumstance that you can find yourself in because it really helps you slow down. Um, it really helps you uh, get a grasp on all of your senses. It helps you get a grasp on all of the circumstances that are surrounding you and all the things that are going on around you. Um, so then you can kind of uh, look at it with a more clear head um, and make the decisions that are going to be um, the best next steps for you in, in any given circumstance. So whether you're experiencing anxiety, depression, uh, relational stress, or um, just parenting stress or, or anything like that, um, this really helps you slow down and kind of see it for what it actually is, as opposed to getting kind of lost in it. Um, if you kind of envision like a heat map and you have all the red spots that are where, where the heat is and all the green spots where it's not so hot, oftentimes we find ourselves really zoomed in on the red spots. And when you're deep in that red spot, it's hard to kind of see the map as, as a whole. And when we practice mindfulness, it helps us zoom out a little bit and see the map as a whole. Um, and so we can kind of see that there's more um, green and cooler spots along with some of these more hot spots in our life. So that's really kind of how mindfulness, I think, helps us, regardless of whatever circumstance we're finding, finding ourselves in. Benjamin, that's a lot. Let's, <laughs> uh, let's see if we can <laughs> melt that down a little bit. And, you know, you and I talked about um, the fact that I've been going through stress. Every human being that I can think of at this point is, is dealing with this. And so if I wanted to 
want to get a little bit more of a grasp of this. And you said there was a difference between responding and reacting. Mm -hmm. Did I hear that right, first of all? Yeah, I think a reaction is really, um, if you look at your body as like an antenna um, and your emotions and your thoughts and all those types of things is just kind of reactions to whatever happens to um, what the antenna kind of brings in. Okay, so give me an example of that. So like I'm gonna react, what does that mean? When you're reacting, it's just like that, that first kind of knee-jerk response that kind of comes up. If, if your kid is running through the house, throwing things around, and the reaction is just to yell at them to stop, yeah. um, that's not necessarily going to help the situation. Um, yeah. You can take a moment to kind of calm down and catch yourself wanting to yell, and then be curious about why do I want to yell right now? That can help you respond to the, to the child in a way that's going to be yeah. um, helpful for their nervous system as well as yours and actually get the outcome that's that's beneficial for everybody as opposed to just kind of yelling. <laughs> okay, yeah, I definitely get the difference there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you're a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure we're clear. Is mindfulness a part of psychotherapy? Yeah, so the psychotherapy and mindfulness are two separate things. Mindfulness is definitely a tool that's used in psychotherapy um, or can be used in psychotherapy. Um, but it isn't psychotherapy in and of itself. Um, they're kind of separate that way. Mindfulness is really more a way of being, um, kind of a practice that you kind of um, develop and cultivate on your own throughout your life and can kind of permeate all the things that you do. Whereas psychotherapy is more a relationship, um, like a transformative relationship that you cultivate with a, with a therapist or, or a trusted other. Um, so it's really about yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a difference between the two. The mindfulness is more kind of how I, how I show up in the world, and the psychotherapy is how I'm in relationship with another human. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm still not totally clear on it, but we're going to get there, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm getting that mindfulness is not like a quick fix. Like psychotherapy, I know, and I'm sure most people are familiar, that that is a long-term commitment that you make with a... Um, I guess the expertise and the um, yeah expertise of someone who has trained for a long time and is able to guide you through a process, but I don't really get the difference between that and mindfulness. And so mindfulness again is it's it's a it's a practice that you cultivate on your own. You don't necessarily need to be in relationship with anybody else oh, to okay. practice mindfulness. Um, but you would teach me how to be more mindful. Yeah, I, I could I could teach you practices and, and ways to show up to be more mindful and, and we can use the relationship to to um, cultivate mindfulness. You can also if like the Grand Rapids Center for Mindfulness, they have eight week courses um, that you can take that will it's kind of like a, a mindfulness boot camp <laughs> where they'll really take you through and really train you how to cultivate an individual mindful pra mindfulness practice. Um, so you can, you can do anything in a mindful way. Like I can be in relationship mindfully. I can eat mindfully. I can parent mindfully. Um, I can do my work mindfully. I can go for a walk mindfully. Um, and so that's really kind of what mindfulness is. It's something that you can bring to most things that you're doing. It's just kind of, all it really is, is just paying attention wow. um, on purpose in the present moment without judgment. That's really all it is. Okay. That that's beautifully simple. And I think, yeah, being present, paying attention, um, noticing what is going on around you and not being so caught up in your own head or your own feelings that you don't notice what's going on with anyone else or anywhere else. So I understand, though, from earlier conversations that stress is often indicative of something deeper in someone's life that is maybe generating the stress. How do you how do you determine that? Um. Well, well, stress can be internal or external. Um, if we're talking symptoms in the sense of like anxiety, depression, or, or uh, symptoms that are related to stress, it's, it's often important to look at the symptoms as just messengers. Um, so if I have a mindful uh, relationship with the symptoms that I'm experiencing, um, that can help me kind of get to the underlying cause of what's causing those symptoms. If we take a symptom management approach to life, we don't always get to the root cause of the issue. Um, and it often ends up causing more energy to, um, uh, to deal with it in a symptom management approach. Kind of like, for example, like for your driveway, if there's some cracks in your driveway and uh, weeds start to pop up, you can just cut the weeds off at the top of the driveway, but two or three days later, there's another weed there. Um, 
and that's kind of a symptom management approach. Whereas uh, kind of a more mindful or or depth uh, psychotherapy approach would be really kind of getting down into those roots and kind of uprooting it, and then doing something about the crack um, to kind of like make sure that that's kind of covered over, so you don't you're not constantly having to go back and, and cut the root or and cut the weed and cut the weed over and over again. So those two things, psychotherapy and mindfulness, seem to partner very well. Yeah. Yeah, I think mindfulness is, an, is a wonderful support for psychotherapy. Okay. Um, what is the science behind mindfulness that shows that it, it is that, a, an important part or a, a great support for psychotherapy? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's a great support for psychotherapy, but just life in general as well. So if you don't ever go to psychotherapy, cultivating a mindfulness practice can really pay off a, a, some really big dividends for you. Um, but as far as the science goes, um, a little bit of a history behind it. A man named John Kabat-Zinn um, kind of popularized this back, or kind of started to bring it to the forefront of Western society back in the late 70s, early 80s, somewhere around there. Um, and he really started to kind of cultivate the idea of, um, that he was working in a hospital, and a lot of the patients that were kind of, quote unquote, falling through the cracks, having like chronic pain or chronic issues that um, the doctors and the medical teams couldn't really figure out what was going on. So he cultivated this mindfulness program by kind of, um, studying um, people that practice meditation um, and noticed that they had less chronic symptoms. Um, and so he brought that kind of took out the, uh, the religious components to a lot of these, these meditation practices and kind of secularized it a little bit and uh, uh, put it in a, in, a, in a format where you could kind of study it and kind of replicate it. And when he did it with these patients that were quote unquote falling through the cracks with these symptoms that they couldn't figure out, they noticed that they had the more that they practice it, the, the more uh, these symptoms started to kind of subside and kind of um, uh, reduce in their intensity. Um, so for example, with pain, a really good mindful approach to pain, or often what we do with pain is we get really angry with it. We, wanna, we want it to stop, we want to dominate it, we want it to go away, and we're very resistant to it. And when we're resistant to something, it, it just persists and it just gets louder because we're not listening to the message that it's trying to tell us. Um, and what he really was teaching people to do was just kind of like, don't resist it, but go into it and just be curious about it. Suspend the judgment of that pain um, and be curious about what the pain is really trying to tell you and really what it's trying to kind of um, uh, bring you into relationship with your own body with. And oftentimes, a lot of these people found that as they did that, they would just notice different things that they were doing or different things that they were eating or different ways that they were showing up in the world or whatever that was, was exacerbating these, these symptoms. Um, and they started to change those little things and those little changes started to cause really big um, uh, and positive out, uh, uh, outcomes in those, in those symptoms. So that's kind of the history behind it of kind of how it started. But since then, there's been lots and lots of studies for it. Um, and lots and lots of people um, from the military to major corporations to um, to, to, to uh, psychotherapy have all really started to incorporate it. And that's basically because of all the, the studies are showing these positive results in anxiety reductions, uh, stress reduction, reduction in depression, um, uh, better relationship with, with our bodies, um, better relationship with pain, all those types of things. What about actual science of the brain? Is there any way that it, there's been a maybe a recognition that mindfulness does make even a physical difference internally? Yeah, there is. There's, um, they've done a number of brain scans on people before and after um, taking the, the, the mindfulness-based stress reduction course, which you can actually take at the Grand Rapids Center for Mindfulness <laughs> um, if you want to. Um, and bef they, 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 they scan the brain beforehand and they take a look at the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of up here in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and then they do it after the eight-week course and then they do it a, a number of uh, weeks down the road as well, as long as people are continuing to practice it. And they find that it's a cumulative um, uh, process, that the more that you do it, there's a thickening of the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is where, um, is really kind of what makes us human. There's a lot of logic there. There's a lot of uh, the ability to kind of um, be in relationship with your nervous system, to slow your heartbeat down, to, 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 to deep breathe deeply, to, to be patient, to recognize. Um, that, that area is really kind of where we, we get control of things. And when you look at how the brain is kind of structured, um, there's kind of like three levels to it. There's like the brainstem, and then within the brain, and then kind of the forebrain where the prefrontal cortex is. And when these signals come in, they go through here first, and this reacts first, and then the midbrain reacts. And it's not until after those two go that this, the prefrontal cortex goes. 
And when you thicken that prefrontal cortex, it actually helps it act a little bit quicker. Um, and it gets, and it can uh, override some of the things that are kind of automatic in these lower uh, portions of the brain. So it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that practicing mindfulness, even if it's just a few minutes a day, or even if it's just kind of sporadic, can really start to have cumulative and positive effects. Okay, well, that is definitely a um, justification. Um, mm -hmm. if, there, if people needed any, that this is a good practice to take on. But, um, and we've talked a lot about um, the symptoms that people might experience. What are some of the factors that you might notice have showed up in, well, let's start with COVID, the isolation that people are feeling as a result of the shutdown, especially older people. Um, what kinds of, um, what kinds of uh, other factors might be um, really helped by practicing mindfulness? Yeah, and in terms of COVID, I think mindfulness um, really lends itself well to, to the situation that we find ourselves in because it is such an individualized practice. Excuse me. Um, because it is such an individualized practice, um, mindfulness can really be practiced in any situation. So if, if you find yourself stuck at home um, and you can't go out or do anything with anybody else, you can still practice a mindful relationship with your surroundings and with your circumstances. Um, and I think that's really where it can be helpful, uh, especially when, when you talked about how isolation can be really, um, it really does have a lot of negative impacts on our mental health. Um, and that isolation can really exacerbate stress, anxiety, depression, um, addiction, addictive behaviors, um, anger, and all those types of things. Um, so if you can incorporate mindfulness, again, like going back to what we talked about earlier about slowing things down, it can help us slow down and see that we are not the circumstance that we're in right now. Um, COVID right now is kind of a collective trauma that kind of the whole world is experiencing at the same time. And trauma from a, from a kind of a, from a mental health standpoint is defined as how the nervous system reacts to a, to a, to a stimulus, not necessarily what the stimulus is. Um, and so when you find yourself isolated or you find yourself in a situation that, that causes your nervous system to really get revved up, um, that's really when trauma really starts to lodge itself in the body. And then so when we practice mindfulness and we're paying attention to the body, we're paying attention to the, stimula, to, uh, the stimuli that we're experiencing, it really helps us slow things down so those things don't get um, revved up and kind of out of control. It helps us kind of stay in good relationship with it and keep it separate from ourselves. You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, I was just looking at Facebook today and there was this whole big deal going on about, well, the, the politics of, of our situation. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of a contentious campaign. By the time people see this, we may have an answer one way or another about what our future is going to look like with a new leader. But um, there was just a lot of frustration from people, you know, trying to cope with people who don't agree. And you see this so often and, and I just, I feel like, gee, I don't know what to say about it. You know, like, um, I think leaders are expected to reach out in a way to actually inspire people to think bigger, perhaps, than whatever's irritating them at the moment. But, but what is your thought as, as you look at the, the politics of what people are dealing with right now and trying to find a way? I think people really do want to be able to work together. They just don't see a way to do it. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, the way that I see that right now, um, and I think mindfulness can help with this as well, is that there's just a, 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 a really large lack of empathy in what's going on in, in our world. It's especially from with those of us that are in positions that were relatively comfortable or powerful or privileged or, or whatever word you want to use there. Um, it, it's it's hard to look at the world and say like things are fine why like why is why is all this this is unrest going on and things like that but again if we're practicing mindfulness when i see something that i don't immediately have a have a positive reaction to if i see something that i don't like and i have a, a strong negative reaction to it i can either react to that and just kind of go with that reaction and start to lash out against it or I can take a mindful approach to it, take a deep breath and really uh, try to be curious about what that reaction within me is really kind of communicating to me. Um, 
it, it could be that, that the reaction just wants that stimulus to go away so I can go back to being fine. Um, but that's not always where peace is. There's a difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. And keeping mm -hmm. peace is really about just kind of stop it. Like, we don't want this conflict. And peacemaking is really kind of stepping into the mess. And practicing a mindfulness around stepping into that can really help us have that emotional um, uh, resiliency to kind of step into that and know that like I am really kind of like uh, on edge right now but I'm going to step into this anyway and hold that tension um, with the other and I'm not going to and I'm not going to deny the humanity of the other but I'm going to step into it and recognize that there is a human being over there um, and how can I be in relationship with that human being. Uh, Nan let's take a moment I'd like to ask you you obviously as a teacher you're dealing with students and parents and other staff colleagues What's going on and, and can you share a little bit about what your concerns might be? Yeah, I, as I'm listening, I'm just thinking about a lot of my friends and colleagues who are um, feeling the stress right now, um, teaching their children from home or the stress of trying to stay healthy, the stress of taking care of loved ones, the stress of financially um, staying stable right now during all of um, pandemic business and just looking for some practical applications for you know when I'm feeling stress in you know in my home in one particular area or one piece of my life what does that mindfulness look like at that point yeah that's a good question um and with the caveat that it's going to look different for each individual person, because each individual person's practices is very unique to themselves and kind of what works best for them. Um, but just some broad applications for it. Um, for instance, like if you're at home and the Wi-Fi is not working and you're trying to get your kid <laughs> uh, to study and the dog's barking and like there's a million things going on. Um, that's really a moment to when, when you find yourself in that, like just do a quick uh, assessment of how are you feeling physically right now and you'll probably find that like your shoulders are up your jaws clenched your fists might be clenched or whatever your body's just tight and in that moment if your body's tight just just see if you can relax it for a second like let your tongue drop to the bottom of your mouth let your 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 jaw just kind of relax a little bit take a slow deep breath with a slow exhale um, and just kind of feel if your body kind of shifts or changes or just kind of like melts a little bit in that moment and then decide what you're going to do. <laughs> it, it can be just as simple as that. Um, if I react from a space of this versus a space of just kind of this, I'm probably going to respond a little bit better now than I would if I was kind of like really tense. And that's kind of, again, like the, the, the concept of mindfulness and the application of it is, is, it sounds so simple but it's just so difficult <laughs> because we get, we just, the, we have the stimulus and the reaction is immediate and we just kind of run with the reaction and mindfulness is really just teaching us that this, there's a space between the stimulus and our reactions. And in that space is really where we can choose what's happening and how we want to respond um, as opposed to just going with whatever kind of comes up first. Um, so yeah, and, I, and no one's going to do it perfect, right? Like there are a million times, just ask my kids <laughs> um, that like, uh, dad's not very mindful all the time. <laughs> um, but even in those moments, when you find yourself after the fact that like, I didn't react the way that I want, or I didn't respond the way that I wanted to, that's also a chance to be really mindful of like, okay, how do I go repair that rupture? Um, and how do I do it in a way that's actually going to repair it as opposed to just paper it over? Um, and so I think that's another helpful aspect of it. And I, I'm also thinking as, as you're talking, how might that look different for our kids, um, our young ones at home too, that might be feeling some stress or anxiety now? Yeah, so <laughs> um, the parents might not like hearing this, but <laughs> um, I think that starts with parents. Um, when I'm stressed or my wife is stressed, our kids are stressed. Um, and when, our, when I can calm things down first, my kids can tend to calm things down. And I'm speaking pretty globally, but I'm saying individually here. But like when my kid is, is having a really stressful reaction or they're acting out or lashing out or doing whatever, I can come in and just try to kind of like shut it down. 
Um, but two things, one of two things is going to happen in that situation. The first thing is the kid is, my kid is just going to shut down and be quiet and kind of go away, or they're going to get louder. Um, and that's not really what I'm looking for. What I need to do and what, and, and what really, uh, from a neuro uh, psychology perspective, just from like a brain development perspective, our nervous systems can attune to our children's nervous systems and we can really help them and teach them how to um, expand their emotional resiliency in those moments. So when, our, when, when we find our kids just kind of overreacting in whatever moment, instead of trying to just shut it down, just bring them in close, um, hold them, put them in your lap and just rock them for a second. Um, or just be curious about what's going on. Just like, I'm noticing buddy that like you, you seem really like just upset right now. Like, what can I do for you? Just be curious in those moments and just see what, what the kid does. <laughs> um, they may say something outrageous or ridiculous, or they may just, just melt in your arms or whatever, but that's, that's literally what attuning your nervous system to their nervous system is doing. Like you're literally coming alongside them and, and, and bolstering their, their ability to deal with those emotional instant, uh, situations. Um, so I think that's really kind of, again, in a mindful way of, okay, seeing my child having this, this, this issue, I have a reaction where I don't want them to have that issue either because I want them to be, to be fine and not to be in pain or it's just really annoying and I need to, I don't want to feel it. Um, either way, it usually comes from a place of peace uh, keeping and not peacemaking. Whereas the peacemaking situation is, okay, now I'm going to go and I'm going to spend the extra few minutes uh, to just, just really attune to my child and really get to the bottom, to the root of what's going on here. Um, that doesn't mean that there might not need to be a hard conversation around their their behaviors or or, or 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 correcting some of those behaviors but it does it from a much more emotionally intelligent point of view in a way that that causes the child to feel seen and heard and, and to have a better ability to deal with it in the future as opposed to just needing to be shut down again in the future if, if it happens again mm -hmm. yeah because as adults we are expected to be modeling for our kids Mm -hmm. And the question is, what kind of a model are we presenting? <laughs> mm -hmm. What are we teaching, <laughs> right? Child's first teacher. Right. <laughs> That's what I always tell my students. You can teach the little kids in the building. You can teach the DK students how to do things right, or you can teach them how to do things wrong. Yeah. You know, it's your responsibility. But... um. <laughs> That's probably key too, Nan, that everyone has some responsibility in these relationships. I mean, you know, um, I remember the phrase, well, you know, everybody's like 50% responsible in a relationship, but I think it's more like 100%. You know, it, you, you really yeah. can't bring your best game to every relationship <laughs> because 50%, it just, you know, halfway just doesn't do it. Yeah. And that reminds me of Benjamin's comment too, that making peace is yes. much more difficult than keeping peace. Like, like you said, Benjamin, it's, it's easy to keep, to keep the peace, but you have to actually go out and, and make it or engage in those difficult conversations or, you know, go the extra mile. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. and it's sort of like people who shout, you know, in a, because the louder your voice is, it's more powerful and it's going to suppress people around you, whether those are children or other people who are just like, whoa, I don't want to get into that. So that whole self-control thing about trying to come back to a deep breathing and to a normal voice and to be okay with whatever another person is feeling, because it doesn't have anything to do with you, really. I mean, you know, total strangers, they don't know you. so you know, trying to be okay with, I don't have to react. I just have to be calm in myself and be myself just be. rather than try to conquer someone. Yeah, I love, Deb, how you're putting that because, again, that, that peace uh, keeping is very much about how am I going to use my power in the situation to dominate and peacemaking is how am I going to step into this um, with humility and empathy and curiosity. And that that's a much more vulnerable and scary place to be. Um, and that's again, why we have to expand that emotional resiliency to be able to step into that much more vulnerable place and, and, and just stay in it <laughs> as opposed to kind of reverting back to the power position where I, where I can just shut it down. Mm -hmm.
That's so powerful too. Just it's that's amazing to to look at peace from that angle. Yeah. I like that too. I do think it's important to point out though that like not everybody can I don't think it, we should expect everybody to do that, especially those people that are really kind of finding themselves in situations where they're really oppressed or something like that. Like this is more work for, 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 for like for me, right? I need to be able to step into this and say, okay, I, things are being told to me. Am I willing to listen? Um, and the more that I can practice that mindfulness, the more that I can actually listen to myself as well as to whatever, what everybody else is kind of trying to tell me. So I think it's, it's, again, it's not a panacea, right? <laughs> There's no answer in that, but it is, it is a posture and approach um, to help hopefully get us to a place where we can start to hash out some answers without vitriol and anger and, um, and just othering. Yeah, I think that the, the people have a right, it's a fair expectation that their leadership take that attitude as well. Like not one side or the other, but trying to, as you say, step in, be prepared that it is not going to necessarily be easy or pleasant to try to resolve these things, but that's kind of what you sign up for if, if you run for office or if you already hold office. And then, you know, in partnership with um, people who have your expertise, to kind of thread the needle here because this is not going to be easy. I don't think it's going to get any easier as we go forward here. No, I don't think it will because there's a lot of, there's just a lot of trauma in our nation right now and not right now, but throughout our history that really hasn't ever been dealt with. And if we're not willing to sit in it um, and really experience it and, and, and wrestle with it and work through it, we're never really going to be able to heal it. And that's really what's needed. Um, and I think you're absolutely right when it comes to leadership. Leaders, in my opinion, are people not necessarily that are, um, out there to take the credit or out there to tell people what to do. They're out there to um, foster relationships and collaborations and really listen and, 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 and try to chart a path forward and then be willing to, to take that path first um, and, and, and go through that wall first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> and that's definitely kind of scary. It is. Um, I wanted to ask you too, um, do you see any difference in the kinds of stress levels people experience, um, say if you were looking at gender or if you were looking at age, is, are there different triggers for people based on those factors? Um, as far as COVID is concerned or just in general? Sure, look at that or, or in general. Yeah, I think, I mean, whether we break it down by, by, by gender, socioeconomic status, race, or, or whatever, um, you, you, there's going to be things that are kind of globally uh, experienced, but then you do have to kind of get down to the individual level as well. I can't just look at uh, somebody and say, okay, well, statistically, you should probably be experiencing it this way. Um, mm -hmm. Like that might be like, I, I might, that might inform how I, how, how I approach the relationship, but it's not necessarily going to be how I view the relationship or how I'm going to work with the relationship. Um, I'm going to ask questions about that and see if that's part of it, or I'm going to let them kind of tell me um, kind of what their experiences and work from there. Um, but yes, I do think there is, there are statistics that show that depending on kind of um, uh, what, uh, where, what, what you identify as or where you identify in, in, in certain categories that you will experience higher levels of depression, anxiety, um, even suicide and, and, um, and, and self-harm and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that really is born of a lot of just kind of some of the traumas that people experience at higher rates um, in some of these other communities that aren't necessarily as privileged as um, the community that I, may, that I may find myself in. Okay. You know, another thing that I've, I've been concerned about is um, the numbers around substance use disorder. I understand that those numbers are increasing, deaths are increasing, and COVID is part of that in terms of, you know, I suppose the isolation, the, the fact that people can't get to therapy support sessions and so on. Have you, have you noticed, would mindfulness be something that could actually be helpful in those extreme circumstances. 
Yeah, again, when, when you're starting to kind of get to that level with people, like mindfulness is absolutely going to be something that could help and can be a part of the, the conversation. Um, but when you're already at like a 10, um, just saying let's practice some mindfulness this techniques is probably going to take you to an eight, <laughs> right? And that's still kind of high. <laughs> um, so you really want to make sure that people are able to um, use that in conjunction with other things like psychotherapy or other um, mental health support services that are out there. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things where we, we really do have to look at it kind of from a more holistic approach. Mindfulness is, is one component of, of, of an overall kind of uh, holistic approach to, to a lot of these things. And so in some cases, then mindfulness is a better alternative than medication, but in some circumstances, it needs to be partnered with medication is what I hear you saying. Um, well, I'm glad you made that clarification because I don't want to say that it's better than medication. Um, medication is wonderfully helpful for a lot of people. Um, and again, like if, if you're taking medication, it's not going to hurt to practice mindfulness. Um, and if you're not taking med medication, it's also not going to hurt to practice mindfulness. So um, I don't think it's a replacement for medication in any way, shape or form. Um, but it is something that you can do uh, that's a self-care option. And I think you can take medication in a mindful way. Um, you can be really mindful about when you're taking it, how you're taking it, preparing yourself to take it um, and, uh, and, and doing it in that way. So, so medication is, is just one, another one component that some people find really helpful um, in uh, surrounding mental health. So um, I'd like you to describe what it would actually look like if someone was in the middle, uh, or not in the middle, but were, were interested in beginning the process. How would you advise them to actually begin practicing mindfulness? Yeah, I think I, I would go back to that definition that I said earlier, just to kind of begin it, that this um, mindfulness is just kind of building an awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment without judgment. Um, and so that's a lot of words. <laughs> and so yeah. really the way the practice that I think is always to kind of start with the breath or the body, because you can't get away from the breath and the body. And it's always right here in the present moment. It can't be in the future. It can't be in the past. It's always right here, right now. Um, and that's why you hear mindfulness meditation a lot. And that's really kind of, that's a formal practice of mindfulness um, where you formally say, I'm going to sit down for 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes, and I'm going to mindfully meditate. And all that means is you're just placing your attention on something, and you just keep bringing your attention back to that thing every time your mind wanders. So if you sit down for five minutes, your mind is going to wander like five million times. <laughs> But every time you bring it back, it's just like a muscle, kind of you're strengthening that prefrontal cortex. It's just like a muscle where every time you bring it back, it's like one rep of, uh, of lifting weights or something like that. And the more that you do that, the better it's going to be and the, the more you're going to get out of it. And so when your mind wanders, instead of getting upset with yourself and judging yourself for I can't do this well, it's just, okay, cool. My mind went over here. I'm going to grab it and I'm going to bring it back and place it right back here. And again, that's why the breath is such a helpful thing to start with because it's always there. It can't go anywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, you can't not do it <laughs> um, for an extended period of time. Um, and so you can really kind of stay there and just be curious about what that is. Another place to do it is just the body as a whole to just kind of scan the body. Um, I like to go from, from the bottom of my feet up to the top of my head and then back, back from the top of my head down to the bottom of my feet. But just for every few seconds, just, okay, I'm going to place my attention on my toes. And what do I notice? Not what is, is it good or is it bad? Or do I like this or do I not like this? But just what do I notice? Do I notice a tingling? Do I notice, is there some moisture down there? <laughs> um, is it cold? Is it hot? And then just move your way up your body like that and just notice what you notice you might be surprised to find that like, oh, my knee is, is, is kind of like twitchy right now and I didn't notice that before. And that's really helpful because if you didn't notice that, your knee might start to get louder, meaning that maybe you need surgery or something like that now. <laughs> um, whereas now I'm like, okay, cool, I can take care of that. Um, so just kind of doing that and going through the body and noticing what you notice um, is really a helpful way to kind of start to cultivate that practice. And that's a formal practice. And the more you do the formal practice, I think you start to find an informal practice starts to kind of just naturally grow out of that. Meaning that you just start to do things more mindfully. Like you just start to take 
uh, like when I drink a cup of water, I just notice the, okay, the water's cool. I can feel it on my lips. I can feel it kind of go into my mouth and down my throat and I can feel it kind of travel down. And it's just paying attention to that and getting a lot of enjoyment or, or um, just awareness of kind of what's going on. Um, and I start to be more mindful in my relationships or my conversations or, or whatever you end up finding yourself doing in the moment, you're just slowing it down and just really paying attention to the nitty gritty. Um, one example that um, a friend told me once was, if I say tree, an image of a tree pops into your head. Um, but if you go look at a tree, that image of the tree and the tree don't really match. There's some very broad strokes that are similar, but they're, they're very different at the same time. And mindfulness really helps you slow down and pay attention to the difference to what you have in your head versus what actually is. And I think that's really what's where the informal practice starts to come into play is like you start to notice the actual differences in things as opposed to just these are all the same. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, and just tying it to breath, I mean, certainly I've taken yoga classes and that's been a big part of that um, or any form of exercise, I guess, where you're really thinking about trying to breathe effectively and then just connecting your brain to that in a steady kind of slowed down way. So it's not terribly mysterious. Mm. <laughs> well, and I also wanted to ask you, um, I understand that you've developed an app that can help people um, in, a, in a, I guess, direct circumstance to figure out how to practice mindfulness effectively, maybe on their own. So can you talk a little bit about that program? Yeah, so thanks for asking about that. Um, I created an app and I called it Metafi, M-E-T-A-F-I. Um, and really all it is, is just a three-step process. Um, whenever you open the app, you can log three different things. The first thing is just what emotion are you feeling right now? It's not asking you, are, do you feel good or bad? It's just asking you what the actual emotion is to bring curiosity to it. And then the next thing is to locate it. Where in your body do you really feel this emotion? A lot of times we feel emotions in different spots of our bodies because again, emotions are just messengers. It's just your body having a physical re uh, reaction to some kind of stimulus. Um, and if we're gonna pay attention to that, st uh, to that reaction, um, it helps us to know where does that reaction usually lie in our bodies. Um, and the next thing is to just kind of figure out what's going on, what, what, what's the circumstance surrounding this. Um, so it's those three things. That, what emotion am I feeling? Where in my body am I feeling it? And what's going on? And as you log those things consistently, you can start to see the app will kind of track it for you. And you can start to see patterns develop. Um, you can look at it uh, on the body. Like whenever I feel something in my chest, that typically means this, this, or this. Um, or you can look at it by the emotion. Whenever I have this emotion, these circumstances seem to be going on, or I, I seem to be feeling it in this part of my body. Or you can look at it by circumstances and you can be like, okay, whenever I'm with my kids, I'm feeling this or that. Whenever I'm with a spouse, I feel this or that. Um, whenever I'm at work, I feel that and, and these types of things. And so it can really start to help you pay attention and, 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 and narrow down triggers or narrow down things that you should be doing more of <laughs> in your life. Um, and so I think it's really helpful to, it's a really helpful support for a mindfulness practice. And in fact, at the Grand Rapids Center for Mindfulness, they use Medify in a lot of their classes to help kind of uh, people kind of cultivate a more informal practice in their day-to-day -day life as well as that formal practice. Um, and I know here at, at um, Mindful Counseling GR, I, a lot of our clients use it here as well, so. You know, it's interesting to use that word trigger because that has been sort of a buzzword for um, people overreacting or perhaps reacting inappropriately to circumstances. What, how do you view the word trigger and, and how should it be used? Because it's kind of a pejorative at this point, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it kind of is. Um, I mean, language is, is language and it evolves over time. Um, and so I, I don't know if I get caught up in, in that saying someone's triggered or anything like that. Um, but I'm just more curious about what is actually going on, what's causing this, um, and, and how can we be in relationship with it? Um, it's not necessarily that it's a trigger where it, if this happens, something bad happens. It's this thing happened, what does it mean to me? What is it, what is it 
uh, what wounds is it touching inside of me um, and how am I in relationship with those things and how is it how is it going to then display itself if I'm just reacting um, if it if, if something touches a wound that's within me and, and causes me to have that kind of physical response to it that doesn't mean that I have to lash out or I have to get or, or have some other kind of response to it but it does mean that I need to that that's uh, an area for me to pay attention to um, and to kind of work with and maybe heal and that's where I think psychotherapy really kind of comes into play is within that relational dynamic between two people. Um, over time, we start to figure out kind of what's going on between us and what's going on within you and I in this moment. And how can we really bring awareness to that and bring it into the middle of the room? And we can both kind of look at it in the here and now instead of just kind of worrying about the there and then. So that suggests a way, maybe we should all just have mass psychotherapy at this point. So we can, you know, stop bad mouthing each other and really pay attention. And, and I like the way that you're referring to wounds inside people and that, you know, people are reacting generally because they've been hurt in some way or feel that what's coming at them is hurtful or threatening. So, you know, I, I can see where mindfulness would be helpful with that, but I'm not sure how we're going to, you know, I mean, it's not something you can just sort of wash over the population. It's going to be something that maybe it's one voice at a time suggesting this, or, I mean, what brings people to you is it's apparently the awareness that whatever is going on is so hurtful or so damaging that it needs attention. Yeah, a lot of times people come and they just, I just don't want to feel this anymore. Um, and I think they, sometimes people get frustrated when I say, well, you're going to have to feel it more <laughs> uh, to really be in relationship with it. Um, but again, it's not about pushing it away because the more you push it away, the more it's going to come at you. It's about really how can I step into it and really be in relationship with it. And I think you're right as far as the wounds that we've experienced individually or collectively as a nation are not going to go away from a top-down kind of powering over approach where I do this and make it go away. It's going to be, can we all step into this mess uh, with each other? Um, and can we do it on an individual one-to-one -one basis? Can we do it on a one-to-community basis? And can we do it on a national level where we're really willing to step into it and look at some really hard, ugly stuff um, and, and say, okay, that's true. Now, how do I, how do I deal with that now? Not, that's not true, or I'm not dealing with that or anything like that, um, or we're past that or something like that. It's, 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 it's still here. It's in the room. Um, it's in the nation. And we really need to, to just kind of take a moment, deep breath and step into it and say, okay, this is, this is going to be hard, <laughs> but we're going to keep walking forward. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that we always hear sort of the, um, I guess the, the platitudes that America has been through so much in its past and we've survived so much and what have we fought for and all of our wars and you know what are the values that we strive for and those things are kind of like floating way way out there you know I don't think that that people can necessarily pull all that in when they're feeling so stressed or so you know attacked by someone's other opinion and so I don't know. I mean, I, I just feel like um, as far as helping people step into it, as you say, um, is there some kind of advice you could give when you know that someone that you really care about or even a total stranger is coming at you, you know, like you're wrong and here's why and, you know, here's what you need to do. How, how would you address that? Um, it depends on the circumstance. If, if the person is like actively being harmed or oppressed in that situation, I think we have to go straight for the outcome <laughs> sometimes. But I do think we do have to get away on a general uh, level of getting away from um, going straight for outcomes and being more in the process of it. What do you, what does that mean to be going for an outcome? Um, if you and I are in a conflict and I just want you to see it my way, I'm going to do whatever I can to kind of power over you or to get you to be on my side or to 
even if you won't come to my side, I'm just going to reject you and push you away. Um, there's no process in that. There's no coming together. There's no like working through the mess with each other. Um, I think that's really where um, good outcomes really come out of process. Um, can I step into this and not have to have it this way or have you be this way? Can I step into this and just be curious about why is it this way and why are you saying the things that you're saying or, or doing the things that you're doing? And the more we can be curious about that, um, whether you're talking about a loved one or somebody on TV <laughs> or whatever, um, you can start to really start to see some of the, the pain that's in there or the wounds that are in there or just the, the, the background that's in there or the fear that's in there. I think there's just a, there is a lot of fear in our, in our nation right now of what could or couldn't happen um, and where things are going. And that's, that's human and, and natural to have fear. But if we're going to just react out of fear instead of just staying in it and working through the process of how do we make peace instead of keep peace here, um, uh, I think that's really where it comes. Like keeping peace is very much an outcomes based thing. Making peace is very much a process thing. Um, and I think that's really kind of, again, it's, we can't just go like, I need this outcome. We're going to do everything we can to get this outcome. And I don't care about what, how we get there. Um, when we do that, we throw a lot of things out the window that we need. Um, so I think that's, I, I think that's a roundabout way of saying like <laughs> where my head is at with all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds to me like you basically carry a very positive attitude about what's possible and um, you know, hopefully that means that even though we don't have a one-on-one -on -one direct uh, conversation with every American citizen, that you feel somehow this does carry forward. And do you see that, you know, no matter who wins the election, that we have the possibility of working things through to a new kind of understanding of each other? Yeah, Deb, I'm gonna I'm gonna be real honest with you. Like I'm I don't I don't have a lot of faith in politics, but I do have a lot of faith in people. <laughs> <laughs> and I think people, regardless of whatever's going on in politics, can figure this out if they're willing to and if they're willing to kind of work through their own pain and and and, and also empathize with the pain of others. And I think when you get more at a local level, I think you see that more often than at a, at a large national level. Because as we get higher and higher up, it's just easier and easier to take the humanity out of it. Um, but when you get closer and closer to the roots or to, to the people, things start to become a little bit more human um, and things start to uh, work through in a more positive way. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do have a lot of hope for, for humanity and people. Um, I think we might have to go through some ugliness to get there, though, <laughs> unfortunately. Wow. Well, um, and I totally agree with you that local is where everything starts. I mean, that is where you can directly talk to your leaders, ideally, and, um, you know, resolve things on a local level. Everything goes up from there. So, mm -hmm. so it's been very, um, very comforting in a way to talk to you. And um, is there anything else that you would like to add before we conclude our conversation here? No, I think the only thing that I want to say is just, just, just my deep gratitude to both you and Annette for, for having me on and for your trust. I know you're running for public office and we just met recently. So to, to bring me on and have a public conversation like this, I think uh, it shows a lot of trust. Um, and I think that's something that uh, our leaders need more of is just having trust in who they're talking to and being with and, and having these conversations. So thanks for going out there. And I, I don't know how you're running for office in a pandemic, but thanks for doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but yeah, I wonder so as well. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I, um, I'll jump in really quick um, and just mention that I really appreciated the app too, Benjamin, and I'm, um, I'm excited to take that back to some of my colleagues at school and use that. I love that you mentioned it developed some patterns that we can see over time. Um, I love the idea of um, a lot of what we do right now at school is about empathy. So um, I think is a, you know, an umbrella approach to everything that we're doing at school. Um, I would say empathy in, um, 
and just everyone that's that's in our lives we need to approach with empathy and uh and just keeping in mind that you again i love that you commented on the wounds that we feel and and validating that everyone everyone feels that everyone has the wounds you know from different things in our lives right now um so i appreciated all of that thanks thank you yeah, yeah man. thanks for for arranging this and hosting it and managing it um, yeah. And Benjamin, yeah. especially, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, I think the one thing that we do want to say, anyone who is experiencing um, emotional or physical consequences of stress, that um, you can learn more at mindfulcounselinggr.com. And that is a good way to contact Benjamin or any of his colleagues. So thanks for joining us. And I hope this was helpful. And I, let's hope that we're through this soon. Yeah. But one way or the other, it sounds like mindfulness will always be a helpful practice. Absolutely. A good fellow traveler. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.